Good morning, and welcome to everyone who is joining us by Zoom this morning or on YouTube. Welcome to the First Unitarian Universalist Society of San Francisco and its weekly worship. I'm John Burens, one of the retired clergy in the congregation, hauled back up here into the pulpit to give our senior minister, Vanessa Russ Southern, a well-deserved vacation. And I want to express my thanks to those who are joining me here to provide worship this Sunday morning. Um, our musicians, Jennifer and Martha Rodriguez Perringer, Jennifer on piano and Martha on flute later. That was a beautiful piece by San Francisco composer Paula Dreyer. And if you're not already following us in the order of worship, it's available for download on the website. I want to thank uh, Jonathan Silk, our uh, intrepid sound man and AV man, who also is doubling as drummer this morning on some of our upbeat hymns, and to his colleagues Eric and Shu Li, are, who are behind the camera. And up here on the chancel with me, Richard Davis Lowell, who is our worship associate this morning. Joe Chapeau is monitoring our chat and can help you if you have any problems with getting connected to us today. And I want to thank Leland Jones, who was here bright and early as our sexton to help us uh, get into the building. I was doing a little bit more historical research in our archives. And the flowers this morning were provided by Amy Kelly. After this service, you'll be able to tune in to our Zoom coffee hour that is coordinated by our wonderful Alex Dar. If you are with us for the first time, we uh, hope you, that you will uh, let us know that you are new and uh, sign up for us, with us on the website for our newsletter so that you can know what is coming up. Today's service is on the theme Turning Points, inspired by several uh, anniversaries, not the least of which is the anniversary this Tuesday of the 100th anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment. We, um, we often think about public uh, events, but there are turning points in our private lives as well as the wonderful novelist Kashuo Ishiguro says in his novel, Remains of the Day. It's all very well to talk of turning points, but one can surely only recognize such moments in retrospect. Naturally, when one looks back on such instances today, they may indeed take the appearance of being crucial, precious moments in one's life. But of course, at the time, this was not the impression one had. Rather, it was as though one had available a never-ending number of days, months, and years, each of which, I would add, can be a turning point. And now I want to light a candle, as we have done every week, that brings into this sacred space the spirit of those of you who cannot yet be with us physically but who are surely here with us spiritually. Welcome indeed. Our opening hymn is one of my favorites, done by Harry Belafonte and Richard Friedman, Turn the World Around. Our song leaders are Asher Davidson and Brielle Nielsen. From the fire, living in the fire, go back to the fire, turn the world around. We come from the water, living in the water, go back to the water, turn the world around. We come from the mountain, living on the mountain, go back to the mountain, turn the world around. Do I 
chancel lighting, you'll find the words in our bulletin. We light this chalice for the light of truth, the warmth of love, and the fire of commitment. We light this symbol of our faith as we gather together. If this is your first time watching us, thank you for joining us. You can follow along in the order of service, as I've mentioned, or sign up for the newsletter through a link that is attached to it. The order of service also lists uh, coming, upcoming events and opportunities to connect. I, for example, am going to be offering several adult education courses this fall, and I hope you'll take a look at those possibilities. And there's the opportunity to join our Zoom coffee hour, which takes place after service. Please join in anything that interests you, including the social action witnesses of this congregation. I believe uh, that's all I really wanted to call your attention to this morning. So let's center ourselves now in worship with our meditation on breathing. As I call Asher and Brielle back, the words are in the order of service. Listen to the song leader if this is your first time singing it and then join in as we sing it through a few times. When I breathe in, I'll breathe in peace. When I breathe out, I'll breathe out love. When I breathe in, when I breathe in I'll, I'll breathe, breathe in peace. peace. When I breathe out, when I breathe out, I breathe, breathe out love. When I breathe in, when I breathe in, I breathe, breathe in peace. When I breathe out, when I breathe out, I breathe, breathe out love. When I breathe in, when I breathe in, I breathe, breathe in. When I breathe out, when I breathe out, I breathe out love. When I breathe in, when I breathe in, I breathe in peace. When I breathe out, when I breathe out, I breathe out love. Introduction to our covenant, which Richard will now lead us in, followed by our sung doxology. Again, the words are in the order of service. Love is the spirit of this church, and service is its prayer. This is our great covenant, to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth and freedom, and to help one another. Oh, 
since July of 2019, when we first became aware of it, we have included in our worship a ritual of remembrance and commitment. We recognize that there's suffering all over the world, brought about by natural and human-caused catastrophes, but we have felt compelled to ring our gong in honor of one particular place of suffering and then to others. Since last July, we have honored the seven children who lost their lives last year in federal custody in detention camps. We also let its ringing symbolize those adults who lost their lives in those camps and who remain in such camps, many suffer separated from their families and now at great danger of being infected with COVID. And we ring our gong additionally, of course, for all those who have died of this global pandemic. Now over 772,000 globally and 65,000 in the United States alone. And this week, the pace has only slackened slightly. We hold in our hearts all of those losses and those affected by them, and all those who continue to risk their lives to provide essential services, those who have suffered the loss of employment and whose lives are especially vulnerable to the disease, and all whose isolation and struggle through grief and loneliness becomes harder the longer this pandemic continues. If one sign of sincerity in prayer is persistence, then the ringing of this gong for over a year is a sign of our faithfulness to the hope that suffering can yet be redeemed. I invite you now to join me in the spirit of prayer and meditation. Spirit of life, God of many names and mystery beyond all our naming, as we ponder today the twists and turns of our history, 
shared and private. Help us to see that the chance for turning is forever before us. Teshuva, you said to your Hebrew children, return. So we must return to what is deepest and most honest and most clear-headed and compassionate within us. So we must turn to what is highest and yet beckons us forward. Help us to know that the possibility of making such a turn arises with every dawn, follows us through every day, is with us even as the sun sets and our own days grow short. Turning, turning to the best, turning to the goodness within those who respond so well to crisis, turning to the best within ourselves, turning toward one another out of selfishness into deeper empathy. These are the twists and turns that matter. Help us now in this shared silence to ponder those places in our own lives where we might turn and be more fully alive, more human and humane, more compassionate citizens who carry forward a legacy of liberation and human freedom that is yet unfulfilled. And help us ponder how in the week that lies before us, we can turn toward all that is holy and help to make this world just a bit more homelike for those with whom we share it. These things and more, now in silence, we together pray. Meditations of our hearts, when we are most at one with ourselves, our best selves, with all that is holy, and with one another, so may it be also in our daily words and deeds. Amen.
In my life, I've looked back at periods of great change and significance and only recognized them years later. This weekend, I asked my husband, what one thing would he have done differently if he could have? In that very same moment, I thought to myself, what would I have done if I'd only just woken up a little earlier, smelled the coffee, passed on that extra slice of cake, not pushed that send button? Then I think, like the threads of a rope, my life can't be picked apart without unraveling it. And once unraveled, it wouldn't be the same. I got to where I am today through a series of graceful twists of that rope, experiences that bound together create a cord of who I am today, a cord that began with a biological connection to a 20-year-old woman from a small Texas town. Mom and I never had the talk as it's described today, a conversation about race and life. Rather, we had the conversation, the lessons, the examples of how to move safely in a hostile world, and the reminder that I was a person of worth. She has so many ways of putting it, so many ways of telling me over and over that what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Each lesson building upon the past, layer by layer, hardening, protecting. She loves telling this one. She's running late to a meeting of her mostly white women's club of which she was president. Knocking on the door, cake holder in hand, she's greeted by a visiting relative of the homeowner who beckons her to the kitchen. Naturally, she's there to prepare refreshments. Making a point, mom dramatically emerged from the kitchen to the sounds of greetings and acknowledgments from her waiting club members. So good to see you, we're waiting for you. Point made as the visiting relative slips upstairs. How about the story of the neighbor who knocks on her door and in a moment of honesty says she wasn't aware that there were black people in the neighborhood? Mom responds, oh, we're very quiet sharing the encounter as a gotcha moment, a small victory, a rejoinder, turning back the hundreds of slights she'd experienced over the years, her fist in a velvet glove. These stories, big and small, surrounded me growing up. Paired with my own, they form a shell through which only the most direct and pointed acts of racism and homophobia can penetrate. Funny that only now, looking back, do I perceive them as layers, layers and layers of experience, teaching, sharing, and lessons that prepared me for a hostile world and continue to protect me to this day. I'm in college, working my dream job, welcomed, trusted, I make my own hours. Then the familiar homophobic slur is tossed in my direction but this time I march up to the perpetrator ready for a serious confrontation. And you know what? He backs down. And yes, I am gay. And from that point forward, I hold my head just that much higher. Still, I know what fear looks like, what hesitation to do what's right feels like. I've heard the voices. You've gone too far. Be quiet. Don't say this or that. It's fear born out of survival, and there are plenty of examples of how speaking up or out can get you killed. It's so easy to think about what I should have done or could have done, or what I promised I'd do myself the next time if I had the chance. I recognize, in hindsight, the path not taken, the road not traveled, the regret, and the shame of not doing. But somehow, the woman who held me for months before I could breathe on my own, who first held me, seems to have passed on to me some truths that reside in me. That in my heart, I know what is right and what is wrong. That no matter the circumstances, I am a person of worth and that I'm loved, and maybe more deeply, that action redeems hopelessness and that redemption is found in doing. 
and with acknowledgments to Robert Frost, somewhere ages and ages hence, two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. So she's much slower now at 82. Technology lets me check in on her briefly, and I keep her privacy by not lingering on the images I see. I think I understand how mothers live on through their children, and I get a glimpse of that when she tells me that she would never forget the birthday of her firstborn. And now we will take an offering to support the works and ministries of this mother church that encourages courage and authenticity in all its children. You can give online by pressing the donation button on the order of service or on the website. And a link is also in the video description and chat. In the payment portal, please indicate if your gift is part of a pledge that you have made or just a general donation. We are truly grateful for all those who help to sustain this community, even in these difficult times. Your giving will now be gratefully received.
a brief reading for us this morning, taken from the German writer Jan Philipp Zendker in his book, The Art of Hearing Heartbeats. Perhaps something in life must be like a catastrophic turning point when the world as we know ceases it to exist and a moment that transforms us into a different person from one heartbeat to the next. The moment when a lover confesses that there's someone else and that he's leaving or the day we bury a father or a mother or a best friend or the moment when the doctor informs us of a malignant brain tumor? Or are such moments merely the dramatic conclusions of far lengthier processes? Conclusions we could have foreseen if only we had read the portents rather than disregarding them. And if these turning points are real, are we aware of them as they happen? or approach? Or do we recognize the discontinuity only much later in our hindsight? There ends our reading. I first chose this theme of turning points when I realized that this month marks some turning points in our collective history that must be noted. Some of them catastrophic, like the 75th anniversary on the 6th and 9th of the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Some of them at least potentially liberatory like the 100th anniversary this coming Tuesday of the ratification of the 19th Amendment to our Constitution, which, while it's often said to have guaranteed all women the right to vote, that wasn't necessarily the case in Texas, 
where African-American women were often subjected to ridiculous tests of their ability, and their votes were suppressed by reason of race, and still too often is. And yet such events were surely, in some sense, turning points. Looking at one's own life, uh, some turning points come clear quite easily. The birth of a child, falling in love, a wedding, a graduation, a job that opened doors, a divorce, a move. Some, however, are far more tangled and hard to see, as Richard alluded to, especially in the moment. And even public turning points, like the ratification of the 19th Amendment, when examined closely, were, as our reading put it, merely the dramatic conclusion of a far lengthier and more tangled process. I think it's easy to forget the long arc from Abigail Adams to Margaret Fuller to Seneca Falls to Susan Anthony and Alice Paul, or how many women and men through that century-long struggle were opposed to equal rights for women, a theme that has still not departed. Oh, there was drama in the conclusion. In August 1920, 35 states had approved the amendment, and only one more was needed. But all across the South, legislators had voted against extending the suffrage. Ratification came down to Tennessee. It passed the state Senate, but in the House of Representatives, the vote was 48 to 48 against taking up the issue at all. The speaker, who was opposed to women's suffrage, nonetheless came under pressure to set a final vote for the next day. And the youngest representative, 24-year-old Harry Burns, who had voted against considering the amendment, read a letter that evening from his mother saying that she was certain that he would be a good boy and do the right thing and support her right to vote. So when the speaker called for the vote on ratification, Harry voted yes, and the amendment passed. Now, I first heard that tale early in my ministry when I served in Knoxville, Tennessee, nearly 50 years ago. And it's a good yarn. It's the kind the History Channel likes to put on television. There's just this wrong with it. Obviously, it makes a young guy the hero along with his mom. And it forgets all that tangled earlier struggle. For example, did you know that the suffrage movement was set back in this country when it actually split over race? Yes, after the Civil War, when the 14th and 15th Amendments to the Constitution were proposed, introducing the word male for the first time and promising black men the right to vote, women's leaders like Susan Anthony, a good Unitarian, and her friend Elizabeth Cady Stanton strongly objected, the latter actually using outright racist language to oppose giving newly freed slaves the right to vote while leaving out educated women like herself. She then began what one feminist historian has called the myth of Seneca Falls, as though she were the heroine at the beginning and the founder of the movement, a version that largely ignored pioneers like Margaret Fuller, or the Boston abolitionist Lucy Stone, and other feminists who knew that the moral arc bends only in stages, and who were refusing to make the perfect the enemy of the good. And yet that split, caused by the endemic racism of this land, lasted a generation and set back the cause of women. Paradoxically, it was out here in the American West where men tended to dominate that women were first granted the right to vote at the state and local levels. Wyoming was the first place, then Montana. And California came along in 1911, nine years before the amendment. A key leader in that effort, by the way, was the Unitarian feminist Carolyn Severance, 
who co-founded our church in Los Angeles and is the great-grandmother of our own member, Merrick Munn. Carolyn was called the ethical magnet of this state. She joined with her friend Julia Ward Howe in becoming the mother of clubs, developing women's clubs, like the one your mom belonged to perhaps, Richard, that tried to bridge the gap between women of privilege and women working and breaking into professions that were previously all male. Julia, who once spoke from this very pulpit, didn't let her lack of a seminary education or ever having been ordained prevent her from being the founder of the first women's ministerial association in the United States. Yet women of her, that era were far too decorous to take to the streets. Some historians feel that the suffrage cause in the United States didn't really become effective until it did march, borrowing that strategy from the far more radical feminists in Britain. But did you know that the first women's rights march in America actually took place right here in San Francisco? It was in August of 1908, led by women from the Glen Park neighborhood, good middle-class women who marched underneath banners that they themselves had done fancy embroidery on. The first march of women on Washington followed five years later in 1913 to put pressure on newly elected President Woodrow Wilson to endorse the cause, as he finally did. So behind every turning point lie other twists and turns, like the cord that Richard alluded to, that tie us developmentally back to our mothers and forebears and make us who we are today and place us where we are in history. My own mother, it occurs to me, was born just six months after the 19th Amendment passed. Her parents had both been orphans from Slovakia who met and married in Chicago and had four children. And yet by the end of the influenza pandemic of 1918-19, they had buried all four. Can you imagine? They then moved to Kenosha, Wisconsin, where my mother was born two years later. And during the Great Depression, which took hold 90 years ago this summer, my grandfather lost his factory job. And for three years, the family was down in Texas, trying to scratch a living out of parched soil and nearly starving. But somehow, when they returned north, my mom graduated at the top of her class in a large urban high school. And her father then stunned her by saying that he would pay to help her go to the university in Madison, something that young women in immigrant families just could not dream of back then. So I know, deep in my bones, that everything I have ever done has been made possible by those who went before me and by turning points in their lives that were just pure grace, though filled with hope and faith and love. Take that first ministry of mine in Knoxville, where I served a congregation full of activists, but also university professors. And since I was still in my 20s, they intimidated me. And I labored over my sermons until they read like publishable essays. Meanwhile, Gwen and I, newly married and new parents of two girls, we're going through the fact that her mother died in an accident. Her only sib, her brother, then took a year to drink himself to death. And we both felt helpless, overwhelmed. I felt burned out in my ministry and asked for a sabbatical, which were not yet common for clergy. And the woman social worker who chaired the committee on ministry had the honesty to say, John, 
We like you as our minister. You're smart and caring. You do fine work for us and in the community. There's just one little thing we'd like you to work on during your leave. Would you please learn how to preach? There's a place for lectures, but it's not in the pulpit. Talk about a turning point. I enrolled at a place called the National College of Preachers, where one of my instructors was a black Pentecostal with a sharp mind and a progressive spirit named James Forbes, who spoke at the last General Assembly where I was UUA president. One assignment he gave us, I remember, was to go to the movies rather than read a book and see if we could get a sermon out of that, about the human experience in it and the good news to be found within that experience. So a colleague and I went out to see a film called, you guessed it, The Turning Point, made in 1977, starring Anne Bancroft and Shirley MacLaine. I won't claim it's a great film, and I see it's not available on Netflix at the moment, nor will I recite all of the turns and twists in that plot, which revolves around the world of professional ballet. But here's what still sticks with me. Looking back over one's life and its turning points can be clarifying, but it must move beyond any regret for those roads not taken or the mistakes we undoubtedly have made. Because what counts is that every moment, now and lying ahead, is a potential further turning point both for oneself and in some way for the wider world. What matters is opening oneself to gratitude for all that has been, along with hope for the grace to move forward in faith and courage, especially the courage to turn love into greater justice. I think of the role I took on after being UUA president co-chairing National Freedom to Marry. At first, as the only non-gay person in the room, much less the only clergy, I had to recruit and bring in more straight and religious allies. And when we lost elections like Prop 8 here in California, I had to learn from Evan Wolfson, the brilliant attorney activist who led the effort, that civil rights history always teaches that there's such a thing as losing forward. That is, using every setback to gather more people to recognize the unfairness and even folly of refusing to allow greater equality. I don't need to tell you that we are now in a threefold crisis here in America. It's part pandemic, it's part economic, and it's part political. I would urge you to forget the narcissistic notion that things have never been so bad before. History knows better. Leave the narcissism to those who know nothing about history or compassion or gratitude or honesty. I think of my mother once again, who was forced once out of social circumstances and basic civility to meet a Wisconsin politician who pioneered some of the demagogic tactics of the fraudulent leader now in the White House and came away saying of Senator Joe McCarthy, hmm, another self-made man who worships his creator. Friends, none of us are self-created. We are here by the grace of those who went before us. And even in the midst of these great crises, collective and perhaps deeply personal, we are forever at potential turning points where the first turn should be toward gratitude 
and then open us to the further grace we need to show more faith and courage. Take the pandemic. It is turning many of us toward an ever deeper sense of our shared human fragility and our interdependence, even as we self-isolate. May we together pray and work to see that it leads to better cooperation in global public health and responses to the climate change that our heedlessness has made a factor in almost every challenge we face. Take the crisis of conscience that white America is finally going through after the police murder of George Floyd, finally penetrating at the public level the denial that is such a hallmark of our culture of white supremacy. Mind you, I think that it's like a collective recovery from an addiction that will require many turnings and repeated spiritual efforts. Yet surely it is something that we are at a turning point where white allies, perhaps for the first time since the death of Dr. King, are again willing to follow the leadership of black nonviolent drum majors for justice embracing now a black woman as a candidate for the second highest office in the land. Hallelujah. And take even our present economic crisis. May it awaken us to the truth that growing economic inequality is bad for everyone. For while 23 million Americans have lost their jobs since the pandemic began, here in California, the 165 billionaires our state boasts, more than any other, have added an estimated 175 billion to the fortunes they already had. There's something deeply wrong with that. And it's why Faith in Action, the interfaith network to which we belong, supports Assembly Bill 1253 that would levy a further tax on the highest incomes to help this state maintain its schools, its health care, its vital services, its public servants. Yes, turning points can be awakening moments. I woke up two weeks ago, got on the bathroom scale, and said, oops, John, the famous quarantine 15 for lack of a gym, time to turn it around again. You've done it before. Do it once again. And the next day, while out walking to get in my 10,000 steps, I saw stenciled on a sidewalk on Geary the words, last night was the last night of my past life. A good motto for anyone who is consciously trying to seize a turning point. Our society has faced pandemics, economic and political crises before. We can use the present one to draw from the best of their courage and spiritual awareness to turn toward our own health, toward the common good, and toward a better future. May we each individually and all collectively do all we can to turn in that direction once again with the same faith and courage that marked those, the best of those who went before us. So may it be. Amen. We'll close our worship today with another favorite hymn of mine, The Fire of Commitment.
from the light of day's remembered, birds of the beacon bright and clear, guiding hands and hearts and spirits into faith set free from fear. When the fire of commitment sets our mind and soul ablaze, when our hunger and our passion In a moment, we will extinguish the chalice here upon the chancel. But its symbols is one of the fire within us. The warmth of love and of compassion. The fire of commitment for justice. Those who will stay with us. And so now in our going into the week before us, May all that is holy burn brightly within us. May its love guide us on our way and show us the path and shine out also from within us, guiding others. For these are the days we are given to live. Let us rejoice and be glad in them. Amen.